Rapids to direct the Asia program here at the Wilson Center uh, because we are being watched live by people around the world. Simply allow me to give a two-sentence commercial for the Wilson Center. Uh, the Wilson Center is the nation's official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, who was the nation's 28th president and, but you didn't all know this, the only president with a PhD. Uh, Woodrow Wilson had a distinguished career in the academic world prior to entering the world of politics and then statesmanship. Um, and like Wilson, we see ourselves as having one foot uh, in each world, that is the scholarly world and the world of policy. Uh, this event today um, is being sponsored not only by the Asia program, but by several other sister programs here, and I'd like to thank them uh, for their help in getting out the word of this program, um, including the Latin America program, the program on America and the global economy, and the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. We're here, um, as you know, uh, for the national rollout of the 2012 National Survey of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, as we approach the culmination of the political season, um, this is as good a time as any or a better time than most um, to examine the political views of this increasingly important uh, group of uh, the American electorate. Um, and we're delighted to be involved in this program uh, today. I want to uh, particularly thank a, a good friend of the Wilson Center and of the Asia program, um, Karthik Haramakrishnan, who's sitting down here. Uh, you'll hear more from Karthik in a minute. Um, he is director of the uh, National Asian American Survey. Uh, in his spare time, he is an assistant professor of political science. Uh, we are most proud of him, however, because last year uh, he was a fellow here at the Wilson Center, and uh, we uh, spent, uh, had the privilege of, of having nine months uh, with uh, him last year. Uh, you didn't come to hear me. I appreciate that fact, so I'm going to vacate uh, the uh, podium now uh, and turn it over to someone whom you probably did come to hear. Um, Yul Kwan is host of the PBS uh, show, uh, America Revealed. Um, he has had a varied and distinguished career. Uh, including as Deputy Chief of the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission uh, Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau. Um, he has a law degree from Yale Law School. Uh, perhaps some of you already know that he uh, was the winning contestant on the TV show Survivor some years ago. Uh, Yul Kwan, we invite you uh, to the podium. We're delighted to have you. Good afternoon and welcome to the release of the 2012 National Asian American Survey. Uh, thank you, Bob, for that wonderful introduction. And I'm sure most of you actually did not come here to see me speak either. Uh, in fact, many of you I'm sure were expecting to see Norman Mineta, but unfortunately he had a conflict, so he asked me to fill in. Uh, so please just do me the favor of pretending that I'm Norm. <laughs> and then I'm actually much more charming than I really am. Uh, now, before we get started, I'd like to give a few acknowledgments. First of all, I'd like to thank the Wilson Center for hosting this important occasion. I'd also like to thank the Asia Program and all the other co-sponsors of today's event. And last but not least, I'd like to give a thanks to all the people who are tuning in from around the world and around the country on the internet. Now, I'd like to begin my remarks by giving a little context for this groundbreaking survey that's being released today. There are over 18 million Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders living in the United States. Between the years 2000 and 2010, the AAPI population increased by 46%, more than any other major race group. As of 2012, API residents exceed the 5% threshold in roughly one in four congressional districts and in nearly 600 cities. And this year, a record number of AAPIs are running for office. 
And these numbers show that we are an important and rapidly growing electorate. And it may very well be the case that this year's election outcomes will be decided by how we vote. But until now, very little about the needs, concerns, and opinions of APIs has been documented. Certainly, there have been lots of challenges to getting this kind of information. The API community represents over 30 ethnicities and over 100 languages. As a result, data collection efforts in the past have often been complicated by linguistic and cultural barriers. And that's why today's release of the National Asian American Survey is such a landmark event for our community. As you'll hear today, this effort is the most ambitious and comprehensive opinion polling project of its kind. On a personal level, I can't tell you how excited I am to see this survey coming out. As many of you know, I pursued a career in public service and in the media because I felt there was a lack of visibility and awareness regarding APIs in the national discourse. I also wanted to battle stereotypes about APIs, particularly those perpetuating false images that we are monolithic disengaged, marginally relevant, and lacking in leadership. Over the past decade, it's given me tremendous pride to see so many APIs become uh, leaders in public life and to become more active in politics. The survey being released today corroborates what many of us already know, that APIs are engaged, that we are informed, that we have diverse views, and most important of all, that we can't be ignored and that we will be heard. And to tell us more about the survey itself, I'd like to introduce Karthik Ramakrishnan, a professor at UC Riverside and a former fellow here at the Wilson Center. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Yul, for that, uh, for those inspiring set of remarks, and to Bob for, for the very warm welcome. It, it feels like just yesterday that, that I left here, and uh, it feels great to be back. Um, thank you especially to the Asia program and all of the other programs who, um, who are sponsoring this event. Um, there is no immigration center at the Wilson, uh, immigration program or immigration institute uh, at the Wilson Center, but you have several programs and institutes that are interested in this. Uh, so thank you, um, Bob in particular, and to the rest of the Wilson Center. Now I'm hoping that this remote will work even if this is closed. Oh. Great. Okay, so one thing I should say is that um, I'm just gonna be providing a pretty quick overview of some of the very detailed findings in the survey. Uh, we actually have two reports that, that, have, that have come out. We just launched it today. Um, one talks about the election. Uh, I'm not gonna be presenting on the election too much. We can talk about that uh, in the Q&A. It's, it's on everyone's mind, and it is the elephant and donkey in the room, so. Um, <laughs> So there's, there's no point trying to skirt around that, so we will, uh, we will talk about it. But I also want to use this opportunity to talk about other aspects of the Asian American community related to their civic and political involvement and related to uh, the kinds of issues and opinions that they care about um, that, that we need to be paying attention to. One thing I should note is that um, the reports uh, that we released today can be downloaded on our website, which is naasurvey.com. Okay, so in terms of why study Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, Yul has already uh, given a, a little bit of uh, the motivation there. Uh, we're a, a rapidly growing population. If you look back at 1960, before the U.S. reformed its immigration laws in 1965, Asian Americans were certainly present in the United States. We've had Asian Asian Americans in the U in the U.S. and Pacific Islanders for for almost two centuries now. Um, but the rapid increase happened after 1965, when the United States passed um, what, what is the biggest comprehensive immigration reform uh, since, um, which abolished country of origin uh, quotas and prioritized family reunification and skills-based immigration to the United States. Asian Americans since have come under both categories, and certainly you also have Pacific Islanders who um, most of whom don't immigrate to the United States, they already are citizens of the United States. Between 2000 and 2010, Asian Americans were the fastest growing racial group. We just beat out Latinos by a whisker. But of course, it's not a competition, right? Um, these, are all, these are all groups that are important uh, in our electorate, and 
as, as we see from, from the various campaigns, uh, as well as efforts like the, the, the massive rollout of the U.S. Census, uh, it is important to pay attention to the kind of diversity and see where the growth is happening. Politically speaking, Asian Americans nationally um, do not enjoy the same kind of attention that Latinos and African Americans do. In many ways, Asian Americans today are where Latinos were maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago. We had many stories talking about Latinos as a sleeping giant, uh, as a group that had grown in numbers but had not yet fully uh, become engaged in politics or was being taken seriously in most parts of the United States. Seeing Asian Americans today reminds me of, of that kind of situation. Um, but we're already starting to make um, some progress. This year in particular, uh, it seems that both presidential campaigns are paying a fair amount of attention to Asian Americans. And that's because Asian Americans happen to live in certain states like Nevada, North Carolina, Virginia, um, where the contest is a little bit closer uh, than in other places like California uh, and New York. Asian Americans, even though they might not be as strong politically, they're still important constituents. So they're more than 10% of the electorate in 40 congressional districts, and they're important in many states and cities. Looking at uh, voter turnout and voter participation, 2008 was a high watermark so far for the Asian American vote. We had 600,000 new Asian American and Pacific Islander voters who, who came out. Uh, on election day in 2008. And given the growth of the population and especially the fact that you have many second generation Asian Americans that are entering young adulthood and, and, and even mi middle age, I guess, the early parts of middle age, we're gonna see increasing growth uh, in this electorate. So, in, so what we're seeing today is, is, in, is in some ways just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and, and we can certainly expect in the next decade and certainly by the next generation, in about 30 years, that Asian Americans will be seen, uh, if not equal to all other groups, certainly as an important uh, constituency to pay attention to. Finally, um, it's not the, the, the kind of motivation in terms of why we should study this is, is not just, say, demographic or popular culture, uh, but also in terms of the scholarship on immigrant adaptation. And the reason why I say this is that most people are surprised when you ask them who the most immigrant racial group is. Most people think Latinos are the most immigrant racial group. But as this, as this figure shows from, uh, from US Census data, the foreign-born population is greatest among Asian Americans. Among Asian American adults, they're 80% uh, of the population. And among all residents, they're, they're about two-thirds uh, of the resident population. This was back uh, in, in 2008. It's changed a little bit since then. Um, and if you compare them to Latinos, Latinos are, uh, immigrants are a big part of the Latino population, but, but nowhere near uh, their importance as for Asian Americans. So if one wants to understand what the process of immigrant adaptation is, it is important to, certainly it's important to pay attention to Latino immigrants and certainly Mexican immigrants who remain the largest national origin group coming into the United States. But it is also important to pay attention to the foreign-born populations within the Asian American population, uh, especially given their uh, country of origin diversity. Another story that has kind of flown below the radar screen, so one, one story is the fact that they're the most immigrant racial group. Another story is that the perhaps the most important sociological and political development in the past two decades has been this massive shift in the voting allegiances of the Asian American population. We haven't seen this kind of a dramatic shift in voting patterns among an immigrant group, uh, except perhaps to the change in Jewish American, Jewish immigrant voting patterns between the 1920s and 1940s. So Asian Americans went from voting less than a third for the Democratic presidential candidate in 1992 to almost two thirds in 2008. Now remember that slide because later on we'll also show you that even though you seem to have a pretty uh, consistent shift over time, you still have a population, a majority of which is still hasn't made up its mind in terms of political parties and maybe something that drives pollsters crazy uh, is you have the highest proportion of people who say that they're undecided in terms of how they're gonna vote. So even though you see this shift over time, it's still very much a population influx and up for grabs. 
I'll make a brief plug on, on the issue of political participation. This is a book that was based on our 2008 survey uh, that is available from the Russell Sage Foundation. I see Janelle Wong, one of the authors of that book in the audience, and, and Teku is here. Only Jane, maybe Jane is joining us remotely. Um, so this book dives into the question of what is Asian American political participation? What are some of the important patterns uh, that we should be paying attention to? When we talk about participation, it's important to note that there are many ways to participate. One, most obviously, is voting. Voting in presidential elections, voting in midterm elections, um, voting in off-cycle elections. But voting is just one part of what is important about civic participation. If you talk to any uh, staffer uh, in a legislative office, they will tell you that, sure, they pay attention to who votes, but they pay attention to who is getting on the phones, sending them faxes. So contacting officials uh, is an important part of civic participation. In addition to contacting officials, contributing money to politics is also important. Engaging in protest behavior, so that's a kind of non-traditional or non-conventional form of participation that nevertheless uh, has impact, so, and, and certainly when the political system is not responsive to the needs of a group. And then we also had this measure in 2008, and we also have it now, in terms of working together to solve a community problem. Now, in addition to that, and that, those, those factors remain the focus of our book, um, we also have measures such as discussing politics with family and friends, working on a political campaign, discussing politics online. Uh, this time around, we had a specific question about uh, Facebook and other social media. And then two other questions we added this time compared to 2008, which is giving money to religious organizations and making charitable contributions to other causes. Now, in the interest of time, I, I can talk about it uh, in the Q&A, or Teku Lee can talk about it in the Q&A, but I'll just present to you this slide. And this gets to what um, Yule was talking about. What we did in our, in our book, and we'll continue to do with our survey now, is to come up with a way to visualize what participation in the Asian American community looks like. And what we come up with here is a, is a category that we call the super participant. And the reason why we come up with this is that there are so many stories about how Asian Americans don't participate. And I'll get to that in a second. It is true. Uh, Asian Americans tend to have lower forms of voting participation than other groups. But like I said, there are other important ways to be involved in the political process. So we look, first of all, at the rate of citizenship people are registered to vote and people are likely to vote, but then we look at all of the other activities that I talked about, and then when we aggregate them, we come up with this measure of about 10% of the Asian American population. Now, it's not just 10% of the Asian American citizen population, it's, it's among all Asian Americans, because you can have non-citizens who participate in some of these activities. So we have about 10% uh, that, are, that, are, that are very heavily involved right now. And that's important to note because even though voter registration rates and voter participation rates may be lower than for other groups, when you look at all of these other activities, Asian Americans catch up, uh, so to speak. So it's not easy to dismiss this group necessarily as one that is non-participatory. Now, when you look at the participation rates, here are just some numbers uh, based on uh, the 2008 election in the current population survey. Those are the top three rows that you have there. And in the bottom three rows, um, we compare the uh, 2008 uh, Asian American survey to other surveys that were done uh, at, at the time from the national, American National Election Study. This is just to show you a comparison across groups. And there's a lot of data there, but if you just look at the top, you'll see that the two biggest barriers for Asian Americans getting fully civically involved are the, the, the fact that they have to become citizens. Uh, Asian Americans tend to have relatively high rates of naturalization compared to other groups, but you still have a big chunk of the population that is relatively recently arrived, and, that, and they need to kind of work their way through the system, so to speak. So citizenship is one, uh, one of those uh, hurdles that they need to overcome. But even among adult citizens, you only have 55% of them who are registered to vote. Now, that's about on par with Latinos, but considerably lower than for African Americans and whites. Once people get registered, they turn out in, in, in about equal proportions to the rest of the population. 
Now looking beyond voting, if you look at political contributions, Asian Americans contribute as much as the other group that contributes the most, which is, um, is Anglo-Americans or whites. In terms of contacting government officials, though, Asian Americans, are, are their, their participation is comparatively lower. So again, you know, here we are in DC, I don't know if there are any staffers in the room, but to the extent that members of Congress and other legislative uh, offices um, do not hear from Asian Americans, they have a very partial view of what the electorate looks like. And then finally, when it comes to being involved in the community, uh, Asian American participation, again, is similar to Latinos. And in the book, what we talk about, the biggest reason, set of reasons why this is the case is related to the immigrant status of these groups. One of the reasons these levels might be surprising to many is that Asian Americans, generally speaking, there is variation within the group, um, tend to be um, uh, tend to be higher educated and higher income than the average for the United States. So to see that low, lower level of participation is a surprise unless you consider the various immigrant related factors. One thing I should note, related to voter registration, uh, so you'll see that date is today, uh, September 25th, it's National Voter Registration Day. Um, and this is an important day for, um, for all communities. Uh, to be able to make sure to make sure that they're registered to vote, um, and certainly for Asian Americans, this, as as I showed before, that is one of the biggest hurdles uh, to get Asian Americans into the electoral process. So you have scores of organizations uh, throughout the country today, at various points in the day, trying to register uh, Asian Americans to vote. Okay, so I've just gone quickly on some of the civic participation. Um, dynamics. I'll just say a little bit about the issues which, uh, which we have never seen polling on uh, with the Asian American community, and I'll try to provide comparisons with uh, other populations wherever possible. And then after that, we will then uh, go to the panel of speakers who will, who will talk about some of the issues the way they see it and experience it in terms of the um, advocacy that they do for Asian Americans. So in terms of the issues, one of the questions we had in there uh, is this is something that, it's an issue that seems to be receding in relevance in the United States today uh, in terms of how much people identify as an environmentalist. There's another question we had on there that you'll see in the report, um, which Gallup has asked consistently over time in terms of whether people, if, if people had a choice to prioritize environmental protection at the expense of some economic growth or to prioritize economic growth, even if that means hurting the environment, Americans over time have become more and more willing to compromise on the environment. And certainly after the economic downturn, uh, that trend has continued. Would you see for Asian Americans on both that measure and on this measure, whether people self-identify as environmentalists, they score much higher than the US average. Now again, this is a pretty surprising finding, right? If you think of someone who's an environmentalist, I'm sure most people don't think of an Asian American uh, as an environmentalist. But we are more environmentalist than, than, than the national average. And that is, uh, that is something that's quite remarkable that is worthy of, uh, of deeper analysis and study, which we and others surely will, will hopefully will do uh, in the months and years to come. If you look across groups, the proportion of people who identi self-identify as environmentalists is pretty high uh, across the various national origin groups. And this is something I should mention parenthetically. When we talk about Asian Americans, it's important not just to provide the aggregate findings, but also the findings for various national origin groups. One thing you'll note here uh, in terms of our Asian American survey is that we were able to interview Cambodians and Hmong uh, during this 2012 survey, which we were not able to do in 2008. Thanks to some generous funders, we were able to collect uh, this data, and we're continuing to collect data. This is a, a tracking survey that we're going to continue through October. Um, but on the issue of, uh, of the environment, we see that among Japanese Americans and Cambodian Americans, um, self-identification as an environmentalist is lower than for, than for other groups. Another major issue that gets talked about fairly often, but Asian Americans don't get asked about too much is the question, on, is on affirmative action. Now this issue is going to be very relevant uh, within a few weeks. The Supreme Court is gonna hear oral arguments in the case of Fisher v. Texas uh, on whether or not the University of Texas scheme 
uh, to ensure a greater diversity uh, in their population is uh, constitutional or not. Now, among Asian American advocacy groups, there's been a little bit of a food fight in terms of what Asian Americans think about affirmative action. Um, you had a group called 8020 that came up with a um, convenience survey, a, a survey of its membership. It was an online survey. And they found a, a, a figure that, that, you know, you don't see these kinds of figures in, in, in survey research, something like a 50 to 1 opposition to affirmative action. Now, other advocacy groups uh, took issue with that, and they pointed to uh, election, post-election polls from California uh, in the 90s and from other states uh, earlier uh, in the decade to show that Asian Americans, in fact, voted to support affirmative action programs when they were on uh, the ballot. But we don't have a nationally representative survey on this question, and we have it here. You'll see two sets of results. We'll see results for both Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And what we see is that there's overwhelming levels of support for affirmative action. You'll have the exact question wording in the report when you download it. Um, but essentially, if I can remember from, from memory, it's, it, the question is, do you support affirmative action programs designed to help blacks, women, and other minorities get better jobs and education? Now, what you see on the right is, what you see is with rationale. And what we did is we did a survey experiment. We actually did a survey experiment where we varied two different dimensions. I'm just going to show you variation on one dimension here. So the rationale that we offered is the kind of rationale that many advocates who want to preserve what the University of Texas is doing say, which is in order to ensure diversity. That is the strongest rationale that advocates are using today. And we wanted to test whether using that rationale moves opinion in any significant way. And we find that it doesn't. In fact, for Pacific Islanders, it actually goes down a little bit uh, when you offer that rationale. But it's important to note just the standard way of asking that question. By the way, this is the way that um, the Pew Research Center asked the question in early, to, in, in, in early 2002, I believe it was July 2002. Um, and we find much higher levels of support for affirmative action among Asian Americans than, uh, than the national average. Two more slides. One on the issue of undocumented immigration. Undocumented immigration affects uh, Latino immigrants more so than Asian immigrants, but this is an issue that also affects Asian Americans. One of the things we've found in our 2008 survey is that on the issue of undocumented immigration, Korean Americans were the most progressive or liberal on that issue. And that makes sense because undocumented immigration affects the Korean American community the most. But it also affects Chinese Americans, Indian Americans, and others. Oh, I noticed that many of the numbers aren't here. OK. Um, what we, so what we ask is, on the issue of undocumented immigration, whether people uh, support the right of undocumented immigrants to get driver licenses, pay in-state tuition, um, and uh, have the opportunity to become US citizens. Actually, the numbers are there, but they're, they're a little dark. Um, and what we find is that the lowest levels of support is for the right to get driver licenses. But it almost approaches 50%. So 47% uh, of Asian Americans, when they're asked about this, uh, support the right of undocumented immigrants to get driver licenses. When it comes to in-state tuition, again, that's 47%, um, just shy of a majority. But more people support these policies than oppose these policies. And then finally, when it comes to comprehensive immigration reform, you have 58%. So 31% strongly supported and 27% somewhat support um, the opportunity for undocumented immigrants to become US citizens. So this is important to note because on the issue of undocumented immigration, this is, pot this is an issue that potentially can be used to divide immigrant communities, where you have good immigrants and bad immigrants, and, and, and you have policies that, that, that that, that elected officials or, or maybe people trying to get into elected office might use uh, to divide populations. And we find uh, a, a fair amount of solidarity between Asian Americans and Latinos. Now, that said, on some of these questions, certainly on the path to citizenship, when, you, when you've seen surveys of Latinos, that level of support approaches three quarters, about 75%. So the level of support is lower than it is among Latinos, but a majority of Asian Americans do support a path to citizenship. And then finally, on healthcare reform, um, we asked Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders what their opinion 
on uh, the Affordable Care Act was. Again, we had a uh, we had a survey experiment. We had a split sample in which half the people um, got, got got the wording that included the Affordable Care Act, and then another half got the wording Obamacare, to see if whether mentioning Obama and Obamacare drives down support for the Affordable Care Act. One thing that's important to note that if you look at the numbers on the left hand side most, um, you have strong you have about three times as many Asian Americans who think favorably of the Affordable Care Act than, than not. Um, this level of support is much stronger than, than in the US as a whole. Um, and that's, that support remains strong when you mention, when you label it Obamacare. When it comes to Pacific Islanders, their support for the Affordable Care Act is weaker than it is for Asian Americans, but it's still, you still have more people uh, who have a favorable opinion than not. Um, and again, when you mention Obamacare, you actually see, you see greater uh, support and greater opposition, right? So the difference between support and oppose remains essentially the same, but that's because more people support it and also more people uh, oppose it. One other thing I should note um, that, that, we, that we have in the survey report that you can download is there is some interesting national origin variation within. So when it's called the Affordable Care Act, Vietnamese Americans are strongly in favor of it. Uh, they were strongly in favor of universal health care in 2008 when we, when we asked them. But when we say Obamacare, their support drops in a pretty significant way. And that makes sense given uh, the still enduring uh, uh, party uh, identification of Vietnamese Americans, but we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in the Q&A. Some of that seems to be shifting. But you see that decline in support. Now, on, on the reverse, uh, and, and I should note that Korean Americans have high levels of support Regardless, and this makes sense because you have high rates of uninsurance among Korean Americans. Uh, so even though Korean Americans, their, their income levels and education levels look about the same as the national average, uh, their rates of uninsurance are significantly higher. So it's not surprising that they would support uh, either Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. And then finally, when it comes to Indian Americans, when you'd say Affordable Care Act, their level of support is lower because they don't quite know what the Affordable Care Act is. But then when you mention Obamacare, their support goes up. Um, and that's in keeping with what we find in our party identification uh, findings this time around, and also this, the, their, their opinions on the presidential race. Uh, Indian Americans are the most left-leaning uh, of Asian American groups. They, they take a spot that Japanese Americans uh, tended to occupy for, for decades. Now you have Indian Americans who are farthest on the left on a host of issues, and also in terms of their political orientations. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, you'll find our publications uh, on our website. And with that, I will invite our, our panelists to, to come up. So I'll, I'll just uh, introduce the panelists very briefly in the order they will appear. Uh, you'll see their bios um, in, in front of you. All of them are supremely accomplished, and they've, they've had such interesting uh, lives before what they are doing now, which is also extremely interesting. So you have um, Deepa Iyer, who has two positions right now. Uh, <laughs> she heads South Asian Americans le Leadership Leading Thanks. Together. Leading Together SALT. Um, it's a group that, that really rose to prominence after the September 11th attacks and the kind of racial profiling that occurred on, uh, towards South Asian Americans. Um, but she, is also, uh, she also heads the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans. And she'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the policy work that they're doing and, and, and their, their, their policy agenda and, and a new publication that, uh, that they're releasing this week. Um, after Deepa, we'll have Mi Moi. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, who, uh, who's, who's, who is the president and director of the Asian American Justice Center. And before this, Mi was an elected official. Uh, I think it's safe to say she's the only elected official up here and maybe even in the room, um, and brings a very important perspective. And an elected official uh, from the Midwest, right? So a very different perspective from either coast. And certainly when it comes to, for Asian Americans, it's important to have uh, those perspectives as well. Um, and so Mi is gonna talk a little bit about the work of, of the Justice Center and, and some of the uh, policy priorities that they're uh, involved in. 
And then finally, we have Miriam Young. Actually, not finally, but among the, among the roundtable panelists, we have Miriam Young, who is the director of the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum. And I have a special spot in my heart for Miriam because um, getting in touch with her about a, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, is what started this round of the survey. Uh, doing a survey like this is, is a lot of work, but it's also fairly uh, expensive to do. And uh, Miriam not only helped secure some of the early seed funding um, for this project, uh, but has helped in, in various ways to try to get additional funding for it as well. Um, this is a classic instance where it's not just academics uh, trying to educate other people. Uh, I've learned a lot uh, from, from working with Miriam on this project. And then finally, Teku is going to moderate the um, Teku Lee, who's my colleague, professor and chair of the political science department at UC Berkeley, uh, professor of law at UC Berkeley. Uh, he also serves on the American National Election Study and is just a, a great colleague overall. Uh, so he's going to provide some closing remarks after um, engaging with the panelists, and then he will um, coordinate the moderated Q&A with the audience. OK. Great. Um, thank you so much, Karthik, and um, thank you to the Wilson Center, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this forum. I wanted to congratulate the team that put together this really important survey in time for the elections. Um, as Karthik mentioned, my name is Deepa Iyer, and I'm the executive director of South Asian Americans Leading Together or SALT. But for the purposes of this forum, I am wearing um, my hat as the chair of the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans, which is a coalition of 31 national groups around the country that uh, represent Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. We are a coalition that was founded in 1996 with the role to really amplify the policy voice of our communities here in Washington, D.C. Our coalition includes groups um, that range in terms of their scope. Um, so the, in fact, the groups that are up here are part of the, the a part of NCAPA as well. Um, but there are groups that work with specific ethnic uh, communities, Korean, Southeast Asian, South Asian, Chinese, Japanese. Um, there are organizations that work with specific constituencies like API women or LGBTIQ APIs, and there are organizations that work on issues, whether it's housing or labor issues that are specific to our community. So it's a rather diverse coalition. Um, and we work very closely in liaison with entities here in DC, such as the um, Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus and the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. The survey that you all have put together provides some very valuable insights on issues that are pertinent to Asian American, Native Hawaiian, um, Pacific Islander communities. And um, I know that we're going to hear more about that, but uh, my understanding is that some of the key issues that the survey points out that are important to our communities are the economy, health care, and education. Um, that's certainly not surprising to those of us who advocate around issues affecting the community here in D.C. and around the country. Um, in fact, just last week, NCAPA released um, our 2012 policy platform. There are many, many copies out in the front um, for those of you who would like to pick them up, and I encourage you to do so. Um, those, of, uh, those of you who are watching us um, online, you can find this policy platform at www.ncapaonline.org. But it's a rather hefty piece of work um, that is a credit to the individuals that are part of the NCAPA groups. Um, the, the platform provides priorities and recommendations along five issue areas of concern to our communities, and those are the economy, um, health equity, education, as well as immigration and civil rights. Um, I wanted to share with you a few observations around why um, your survey, um, in, in terms of the folks who talked about their personal priorities, believe that the economy and healthcare are top priorities, and talk about that from the standpoint of NCAPA. So with the economy, it's not a surprise that um, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders are also worried about their job prospects and unemployment. In fact, um, our community's workers have been hit hard by the economic downturn. Unemployment has increased 4.1 points since 2007 for our communities. Younger Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders aged 20 to 24 have been the hardest hit with a six point increase in unemployment. Moreover, studies show that our community members are actually remaining unemployed 
longer than any other race group in this country, and they have a harder time finding new employment due to a variety of factors, including language barriers. Um, for instance, in California, we know that nearly half of all the unemployed Asian Americans in that state had been out of work for 27 weeks or longer compared with 40% of Latinos and 42% of whites for the same time periods. And obviously, this is, of course, of no surprise to those of you in this room and those of you who are listening, but our community members include individuals that are at both extremes on the economic spectrum, those who are financially stable and those who are living in poverty. In fact, Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders living in poverty increased over 450,000 from 2007 to 2010, and that represents an increase of 30% for Asian Americans and 40% for Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, compared with a 21% increase for the national population. In addition, factors such as linguistic isolation, limited access to financial resources, lower educational attainment rates, all add to the financial distress that many in our communities are dealing with each day. And so it is of no surprise that the economy and jobs and access to jobs um, come up as the top concern for those that were surveyed um, in this particular survey. Moving on to health care and equity, a few observations to set the context of why that issue is important to our communities. More than 2.3 million Asian Americans and 162,000 Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are uninsured in our country. And our communities are also disproportionately affected by obesity, certain types of cancer, diabetes, hepatitis B, substance use disorder, and domestic violence. So it's not surprising to see again that healthcare is an important issue and that there is general interest in this issue for those who claim to be Obama supporters. Um, the passage of the Affordable Care Act was lauded in the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community, um, primarily because of a number of um, pieces in that legislation. Um, it would, in by 2014, for example, the expansion of the ACA of Medicaid will mean that an additional 9% of Asian Americans and 13% of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations will have health insurance. And there are other reasons um, that, that this piece of legislation has impacted this community in, in such a way. But there are gaps. Um, one main one, and this kind of leads into my last point, which is around immigration, um, is that with the health care legislation, it does not currently um, remove the federal immigra immigrant restrictions um, in Medicaid. So right now, there's a five-year waiting period for those who are lawfully residing in this country who are immigrants. In addition, undocumented immigrants are not allowed to purchase private plans in the individual exchange under the ACA. Which leads me into immigration, which is, um, I know that we didn't talk about that as much, but it's obviously a very important issue, and um, you will see it in depth in our policy platform. Three quarters of our community are foreign born. And there are about 1 million Asian Americans who are undocumented out of the 11.2 million in this country. Um, so we have a number of uh, policy recommendations around a path to legalization, as well as around um, family reunification and um, opportunities for immigrant workers, both skilled and unskilled in this country, that we make here on this platform. So those are just three of the key issues that I think um, actually overlap with what we see in the survey uh, that I wanted to lay out. But the big takeaway I think for that I wanted to convey is that what we need our political parties and elected officials and those running for office to do is to not talk about the, these issues in broad strokes, that we really need them to connect to Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders by understanding and framing these issues in the ways that we perceive them and experience them. So in talking about health care, in talking about um, educational attainment, in talking about the economy, understanding that our communities uniquely experience those issues because of immigration status or linguistic isolation is going to be very important um, for um, political officials, whether they're running for office or in office, to really connect to our communities and increase our civic and political engagement. So thank you again. Great. Thank you, Deepa. And I'll just mention two, I'll just use this opportunity to just plug two data points that I didn't get a chance to do related to this. So to, uh, in addition to asking what is the most important issue facing the country, what we did this time around and also before was to ask what is the most important issue facing you and your family. Mm -hmm. The reason why we do this is that it's one way to think about what an Asian American agenda is, right? So certainly you have advocacy organizations that do very important work. Uh, in terms of their agenda. And here is an instance where 
the, you know, people may be very skeptical. Oh, what do the advocates really know? Well, what we find is that when we aggregate up what people say are the most important issues, economy in general was two thirds, unemployment, um, two thirds of the people said that that's one of their top two issues. A uh, little over one third said unemployment, but healthcare was mm -hmm. close to one in five. Uh, and education was about one in 10, 10% of the population. And we also asked a question, and I won't go into too many of the details, you can see it um, in the report, um, in table five of the issues report. Uh, you'll see that in terms of, we not only looked at the unemployment rate today, mm -hmm. we asked them if they've experienced any job loss in the last four years mm -hmm. since the downturn. And there we have 14% of Asian Americans that have experienced job loss. And certainly even in the high tech sector, you've had a lot of job loss. Some people have gotten those jobs back. Uh, maybe not as good as before, but that, that is an issue that certainly affects our community. Um, and then finally, in terms of foreclosure rates, we find that the rate is 5% overall, but it's very high among Cambodians, 11%, among Americans, 11%, and Samoans, 16%, have experienced a foreclosure in the last four years. So economic hardship is not something that is, uh, that is absent in this community. There, there are many sectors that have experienced it. Thank you. Thank you. Again, uh, my name is Mi Moan. I'm the President and Executive Director for the Asian American Justice Center. I'm really um, proud and honored to be on this panel amongst all my colleagues here and um, just really proud of the work that Karthik has done um, in, in such a profound ways. Um, so on behalf of the Asian American Justice Center, um, we're a member of the Asian American Center for Advancing Justice. I want to welcome um, all of you, and, and I really welcome today's conversation, and in particular the comprehensive findings uh, in this national survey. Um, I, I do want to thank all of our partners for their work and support, and I'm really proud uh, to be a part of this collective effort to ensure that the Asian American and Pacific Islander community is both recognized and counted uh, in this country. Our mission at AJC is to advance civil and human rights for Asian Americans um, and to build and promote a fair and equitable society for all. Um, we believe that justice and equality can only be achieved when we all have a seat at the table. And we believe that we can leverage for a seat at the table when we have greater visibility, influence, and power. We also believe that to achieve this, we need to present the evidence, build capacity within our community, and lead movements both within and without the larger Asian Pacific American community. So this is why for over 20 years, uh, AJC have advocated for policies and programs that enable and empower Asian American, Pacific Islanders, uh, and Native Hawaiians, and other vulnerable communities to reach their full potential. In that effort, AJC has spearheaded efforts to address and fight against unfair and discriminatory structures and institutions that systematically deny Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders and other vulnerable communities their civil and human rights. You should know that AJC, in partnership with 74 partner organizations and individuals, submitted an amicus brief to the Supreme Court on the Fisher case. And I'm excited to see that this national survey supports our position, which is the position that Asian Americans, regardless of how you ask the question, affirmatively supports the types of policies uh, that were being promoted at the University of Texas. So in the way that we do our work among all the tools in our advocacy kit, research, research, and the compelling evidence of the data by, about, and for our community has been the most powerful tool. The release of this survey is extremely timely, and the findings further demonstrate what many of us already knew that the AAPI community is a very significant social, cultural, and political player. Last May, AJC, in partnership with API Vote and the Asian American Institute, commissioned Lake Research Partners to conduct the first survey of Asian American and Pacific Islander voters for the 2012 election, focusing on their voting patterns and behaviors. We found out that while the media headlines, mainstream political parties, and candidates continue to push our community aside, grossly underestimating our community's influence, that regionally, on a state, regional, and local basis, we have the strength of numbers to be the marginal difference. The AAPI community is energized, 
and engaged this year, as these results have demonstrated, and we have the potential to be the margin of victory. As Karthik has indicated, as a former elected official, I have witnessed time and again the failure of mainstream political leaders to calculate us into their core engagement strategies. I've heard all the excuses. The numbers are too small. There are too many groups. It is too hard to provide materials in so many different languages. It is too hard to tell what issues are important to these communities. Well, the information in this survey has just about eliminated all the excuses. Let me repeat what I have often said many, many times. Anyone who ignores our community does so at their own peril. Today's findings go beyond November 6, 2012. These results keep our community relevant, not only in this year's election, but in future elections that will impact our communities and our families. We must make sure that the issues that are important to our communities, such as jobs, immigration, and education, are addressed by both national parties and political candidates. We are less than two months away from this year's election, and we will use this opportunity to build the movement of the AAPI community so that we can be heard, so that we can exert influence and empower our community. We have the facts, we have the numbers, and now we must use this information in the best way possible to mobilize the AAPI community and be heard this year. So I want to applaud the work of our partners today on this comprehensive report, and I really do look forward to working with all of you to ensure that our right to vote is protected, amplified, and to, uh, to execute a November where our community does have visibility so that people will respect us when we actually are at the table. I have, I have nothing to add to that. So <laughs> then we go to Miriam, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Miriam Young. I'm the executive director of the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum. We're the country's only national multi-issue progressive social justice and human rights organization for Asian Pacific Islander women and girls. Um, we have chapters in 12 cities and staff in New York City and DC. And we, we go by NAPOF by short. Um, unless you're from the Midwest, sometimes people call us NAPOF. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. um, I want to start uh, just by reflecting a, a little bit and picking up where me left off about the importance of this kind of work and survey. Um, the, the lesson that I carry with me, having spent 10 years working in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender movement, is that when we don't have adequate information or stories told by ourselves, the community tends to make up stories about you, right? And so in the LGBT community, we used to talk about the lack of data about lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people rendering us as mythical beings. Um, we called ourselves unicorns. We were like data unicorns. <laughs> maybe we exist, maybe we don't exist. Some people think they've seen us before. <laughs> you know, they, have, they ascribe all these characteristics about us. We're, we're magical, mystical, you know. Um, and certainly this is true in the Asian American and Pacific Islander community as well. And I would like to point out, of course, that the most harmful mythical creation about our community has been the model minority myth. And we're still recovering from that story that was told about us in 1965. Today is an opportunity for us to tell our own stories and tell the truthfulness of our stories in all of its complexities and all of its contrasts. And as we've heard, um, even from the description uh, that Karthik has given, we are a community of contrast, right? We cannot be um, just monolithically portrayed. This survey of, uh, I, I'm very proud of it. Uh, you know, Karthik and I, I feel like we, um, you know, a year ago kind of created this thing out of nothing. <laughs> um, and it is the largest survey that will have ever been done in the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Um, nine Asian languages is what the survey is being conducted in, plus English, plus Spanish, and in large enough numbers that we can disaggregate it to not only the top six uh, ethnicities, but including Hmong, Cambodian, um, and Pacific Islanders. This is huge, a huge undertaking. And uh, also the survey, of course, asked these questions, which the advocates and community groups on the ground are most interested in learning about our communities. We want to know what are the issues that affect the daily lives of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, 
not only so we can tantalize the media about how we might vote on November 6th, but also to offer our community-based organizations um, ways to talk about and work more effectively and the baseline data that we need uh, to most eff effectively serve our communities. You know, there's a Chinese saying, um, women hold up half the sky, right? Uh, actually, in this room, we hold up more than half the sky, if I'm uh, doing the counts of seats right. <laughs> Therefore, no conversation about the building of power for the Asian American and Pacific Islander community is complete without attention to gender issues. Right? And indeed, no efforts to build the power of any community is successful without the inclusion of women. I'm proud to sit here with my colleague executive directors um, of national Asian Pacific, and, uh, Pacific Islander organizations, the majority of whom are women, by the way. And I, you know, in, in addition to us three, I also see Christine from API A Vote and Gloria from Apex. Um, the API movement is powered uh, by women. So is our congressional leadership. <laughs> Currently, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus is led by an Asian woman, uh, Congresswoman Judy Chu, and I saw her staffer here earlier. Therefore, the opinions of Asian American Pacific Islander women are critically important um, for us to remember and to think about and to uh, know that they not only affect us in our individuals, but as is true in my own family, my, what my mother thought and how my mother felt clearly influenced what kind of day we were having in the house, <laughs> right? Like Asian American women's decisions affect our entire families and our communities. We know from earlier research, particularly around immigrant women, that women are the drivers of healthcare decisions, education decisions, naturalization decisions, jobs, neighborhoods, where we live. We keep the, we keep the ship running. Right? Asian American women and Pacific Islander women keep the ship running. Therefore, it's interesting that we're at this moment of time when policy discussions around the country and federally um, are centering issues that uh, intimately affect women, particularly uh, about women's bodies, about our rights to our bodies, about what kind of decisions we can make or can't make. Um, and so I have to say, uh, Asian American women are a critical part of that conversation, um, and this survey is one way we can assert that. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Miriam. And finally, uh, yeah. <clears throat> and finally, we have Teku Lee, who you know, when I said Miriam was close to my heart, Teku Lee is also very close to my heart. Um, from the academic side, I've known Teku for over a decade, and. Um, in many ways, we, we joke about Harold and Kumar movies and my, how we might be the academic, the academic version of that. And if you look at our personalities on stage, maybe it <laughs> plays to type a little bit. Um, but Teku is specifically on this project. I mean, at, at times, he, we've both frustrated each other in different ways we could have asked questions, uh, burning the midnight oil and then some in terms of trying to really uh, get the questions right. There are so many new questions in the survey. Um, but it's been great to be on this journey with them, and, and Teku's going to provide some closing remarks and thoughts. And I guess then maybe we should just go to the audience sure. for Q&A. Sure. Well, if I'm, uh, if I'm in Karthik's heart, I am the deep, fibrous scar tissue in Karthik's heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, Karthik asked me to do some uh, time-honored uh, custodial work to close out this panel, which is to tidy up any kind of loose ends that I saw. And I guess... There's two things. One is I would say, you know, I, I don't want to misrepresent this as being the first ever such kind of project. There's been a lot of efforts uh, before us that we've built on from uh, academics, from advocacy organizations such as the AJC survey, um, from think tanks such as the Pew survey that came out earlier this year, and from government agencies to try to collect good uh, data on what is happening with AAPI communities. I think what uh, sets this uh, project apart and also in its initial uh, conception in the 2008 National Asian American Survey uh, is an effort to really do a deep, deep dive into policy issues that are affecting the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities and link those issues to politics, uh, to the political engagement of AAPI uh, communities. Um, 
uh, the other, I think, the other important bit of tidying up that I think I, I should mention, and I can, I think I can mention because I don't have a affiliation with the Wilson Center, either current erstwhile or forthcoming. Uh, and in fact, my institutional affiliation is with Berkeley, which most people will associate with being so far on one end of the political spectrum that the idea of being apolitical is kind of off the table. Is we do have a separate report on um, the questions related to the 2012 election uh, out of this survey. I think um, we designed this panel on a very important principle that there are a lot of policy issues affecting AAPI communities home foreclosures, immigration reform, healthcare access, reproductive rights that deserve their day on center stage, and that's why we're talking about those issues. But of course, a lot of people's attentions are on what is likely to happen in November and what is likely to happen in November, not just in the presidential races, but also in a lot of state and local races will have a profound effect on what kinds of resources and attention is given to policy issues affecting API communities. So, uh, we do have a lot to say out of this survey about how Asian Americans are likely to vote, whether they're actually being mobilized uh, to vote or whether they remain ignored by most campaigns and candidates, and also what their partisanship uh, looks like over time. And I think we would be happy to take any questions that you had on uh, those more you know, election-related aspects of the survey. And I think with that, we, we can just open the floor up. And maybe just mention briefly your affiliation when, when you introduce yourself. So Teku's going to handle this. Yes. Aziz Hanifa with the newspaper called India Abroad. Uh, this question is for Karthik, and I've got a question for Deepa, too. Uh, your report seems to echo what some of the earlier reports have done, that Asian Americans uh, tend to lean more democratic. And the Indian American community in particular that you've mentioned overwhelmingly tend to lean democratic. Uh, from my covering the community for the past two decades, I've found that the older Indian Americans, uh, mainly physicians, entrepreneurs, et cetera, have tended to be a Republican in the sense that being fiscally conservative uh, while socially moderate. Can you explain this dichotomy uh, in terms of the methodology you used? And for Deepa, uh, in terms of SALT, which uh, of course is democratic leaning, what are some of the mobilization issues uh, that y'all are going to do? And I, and I didn't find enough mention in the report about uh, civil rights, hate crimes, et cetera, which seems to have become a very burning issue today, especially among South Asian Americans. Great, I'm gonna take your first question while looking at some data, so I'm running this data as we, as we speak. Um, so looking at, um, looking at these patterns by, um, by age group, um, we we actually see that there's not. I'm just looking at this now because it's an interesting question. Their age does not seem to be that strong. Uh, of a predictor. Well, we, and, and the thing is, ultimately, you're talking about a community that is relatively prosperous. So it's hard to do the math to come up with well-off people voting Republican because most of the community is well-off and they're overwhelmingly Democrat. So what is going on here? And there, I mean, I think it is interesting. To me, this points out the need to do a survey like this because the kind of people that get media attention usually are donors. So donors might look very different from the population. And donors get involved in politics and give money to people no matter what their affiliation might be. So people who might, who might self-identify with one party might still make contributions to another party. There are many reasons why they make political contributions and try to get themselves uh, in the news. Um, so it's pretty, I mean, this, this evidence is pretty solid, right? So when you have, I mean, first of all, I, 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 I stand by our research in a very strong way and it's, it's not partisan at all and it's scientific but you've had many different data points that are showing this. So, th so there is something there. In terms of why it's happening, I mean, there are, there are a couple of factors. One is it's part of that general trend that you see in the last 20 years. Uh, Indian Americans have been like other Asian Americans in which even the doctor community uh, might have been skeptical of the Democratic Party and, and were Republican supporters, uh, but started changing their mind during the Clinton years. And, uh, and have continued along that trajectory. But 9-11 did play a significant role. Um, so you had people who themselves were affected in terms of racial profiling, 
But generally speaking, you had these party images that came into being. And this is some of the research that I do, which is not just on Asian Americans, but also immigration. Over time, the Republican Party has gotten captured by a pretty conservative wing on immigration. And so the image that gets sent out to immigrant communities is a fairly conservative image on immigration. And so that, that, that hurts the party in trying to make outreach, especially for a group that is starting to feel its way into the political system, right? If you're trying to decide if you're going to join a party, literally speaking, and, and Teku has done work on this, um, you, you want to see the best image possible of a party. And when you see images of a party that seem exclusionary, um, that, that makes people reluctant to join. So the, the only last thing I would say is that what's interesting is that you have some very prominent Indian elected officials, Bobby Jindal and Nikki Haley, uh, who are Republican, but in many ways they're, they're, they're a major exception to the norm. Uh, when you see the, the electorate, it's, it's very different. Um, so I'll just answer your second question, Aziz. Um, so wearing my SALT hat, um, just a quick point of clarification, um, SALT is all of the organizations appearing in this room are nonpartisan organizations, and we work on issue analysis and advocacy, um, and our work um, at SALT is actually infor informed by a network of 40 local organizations around the country that serve South Asians directly, so it's issue analysis. Um, in terms of the civil rights piece, I haven't actually seen the data in the report that Karthik is referring to um, and has been talking about on civil rights, but certainly, as has been mentioned, 9-11 was a turning point for South Asian Americans in the United States, and we've seen in our work, I mean, you'll see it reflected in this um, and COPPA platform as well, that civil right, within the civil rights um, sphere, there are a number of issues pertaining to uh, South Asian, Sikhs, Muslims, Hindus, um, that are related to employment discrimination, racial and religious profiling, for example, at airports, um, as well as hate violence. And I, I know that all of us um, know about the, um, the really violent act that occurred at the Sikh Gurdwara in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, on August 5th that took the lives of six people. And so clearly, um, hate violence and this climate of um, Islamophobia, xenophobia, and profiling is one that South Asians find themselves in and have found themselves in over the past decade. And we have a number of policy recommendations related to that. So it is something that affects the community. Um, they might not be calling it words like profiling, um, but these are issues that we've seen time and time again. People feel that they're being targeted that they're being singled out based on their race, where they come from, or their religious attire. Um, and we do have many recommendations in terms of what Congress and policymakers need to do to advance and preserve civil rights for all Asian Americans, including South Asians. One just quick thing, looking at this data, I was going to say the, uh, the highest support for the Democratic Party is among people 50 to 59 and 60 to 69. So it's actually strongest among older Indian Americans. I've got a quick follow-up topic. Well, I think we have to uh, be just, just sure. to this because there has been some uh, problems with polling, with some people saying that people tend to use cell phones more than they use landlines today. I'm glad you asked that because we did this interviews both in cell phones and landlines. So um, this is um, so we don't have that issue now with this poll. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, Nare Choi from Edmund, Edwin O. Reichardt Center for Asian, uh, East Asian Studies. Um, I have a question regarding the um, interracial marriage. Um, you know, that was the biggest, one of the biggest issues that came out of the most recent census data. And I was wondering how you um, factor that in defining each community as Hmong, Korean, or Chinese. Is, is there any interracial marriage? Is there a difference in the rate of interracial marriage? So if you could comment on that. I'll just uh, briefly say that, I mean, the, the best data, if you want to find out about interracial marriage, is, is some of these government statistics, um, like, um, like the U.S. Census and the American Community Survey. Uh, because the way we did the survey um, is, is not, you know, we don't have the, even though the U.S. government doesn't have that much resources, it certainly has more than what we were able to muster. Um, so we rely on... Um, couple of methods. One is a, a listed sample, but this listed sample that we use is not just based on um, analysis of the first, middle, and last name, but also the ethnic concentration of people in a, in a census tract. Um, we also have 
multiracial people that are in the mix because we ask people, is there any part of your background that you consider to be Asian? And in fact, one of the things I had to, when I was monitoring the data, so I spend a lot of late nights and early mornings looking at the data as they come in. Um, some people said, yes, I consider some part of my family background to, the, to be Asian. And then later on, it turns out that they were white or African-American who had an Asian spouse. Mm -hmm. So that was a wasted interview, you know, but <laughs> thankfully it wasn't too often that that occurred. Um, but that's, that's a way that we try to um, bring in multiracial populations is to ask that question in the broadest way possible. But if I, if I can just add, I think we our, our survey by the, you know, federal agencies that run multi-million dollar surveys can decide what kind of population they want to study, and then they can ask questions about it. And in doing it that way, you're likely to get good estimates of how multiracial different uh, racial and ethnic communities are. What we have to do is first come up with a sampling strategy to decide who, who's likely to be Asian American out there. And one of the methods we use is to match by people's names. And so if you, if you, one of the groups that's especially likely to be undersampled, if you take that kind of approach, is an Asian American person who might marry uh, outside their race and then take on a different surname, which is not easily identifiable as an Asian uh, name. So when they're in our sample, we're able to look at um, all the issues in the same way that we could with everybody else in the sample, but their likelihood of being in our survey is going to be slightly less than if we had infinite resources. Now we do, uh, unlike last time, we do also, we do have a, a chunk of our interviews that were done when we did a general dial of the listed sample. So we, you know, later on, uh, maybe in a year when we've had time to catch our breath and analyze this data, we will have companion samples of whites, African-Americans, and Latinos from this general list. If they happen to be Asian American, they qualify, but we also continue the interview with those, uh, with those other groups. Mm -hmm. Take your question. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, Mike Masetic, PBS Online uh, NewsHour. Uh, some of your answers up to now are indicating this, but I don't know whether specifically you were talking more about Indian Americans or across the board. But there seems to be a lot of stereotype busting going on here because the general perception of, of Asian Americans concentrations of what are traditionally strong Republican groups, small business owners, social, religious conservatives. These are two uh, pillars of the Republican, even the current Republican Party, and yet the trends you're showing are somewhat against that. And to go back to what you were saying earlier about Jewish groups switching in 1940, that was largely driven by the perception that Roosevelt was far more ready to stop Hitler than the Republicans. Uh, is there, underneath the, the, the economic and social demographics here, some sort of driving issue that's pushing so many Asian Americans in the direction of the Democratic Party and away from the Republicans? Well, one thing just on the historical, uh, there have been a couple of historical studies that actually identify the shift um, at the start of the Great Depression. So you, what you had among, with, with Jewish American votes is that you had a class base differentiation, so wealthier Jews were voting Republican and, and more, con and more uh, poorer Jews were voting Democrat. Um, but after, this is after FDR first came to office, well before World War II, um, with the New Deal, that started shifting. Now, it got fully consolidated by 1940, but, but the 30s were kind of where most of that action, uh, early 30s itself, it started. But I think that certainly plays a role. Now, when it comes to you know, one, one of the, one of the uh, findings in the, in the Pew study, which is, has very good coverage on religion, and what we find here, I mean, so some of this you need to go beyond the survey and look at other, uh, other pieces of evidence, and this is where party image does make a difference. So you have, I mean, especially for South Asians, you have populations that have high Hindu populations and Muslim populations. And when you have a party that explicitly... Uh, you know, cast itself as a Christian party. You've had major political, and during the political primaries, you had candidates that, um, that, that wore their religion on their sleeve in a very significant way. Um, it, it seems less hospitable. Now, this is something that the Republican Party will have to come to terms with because they are also a diverse party. And America, the U.S., is becoming more diverse, not just racially, but also in terms of religion. Uh, and so I think that will... 
uh, continue to be a challenge. I mean, I think it's fascinating that the two prominent Republican Indian Americans converted to Christianity. I think it gives a little bit of a statement of what it might take to to have a to feel fully at home and to win within uh, the Republican Party. I think that is that is a challenge. Religious diversity is an important issue. Yes, sir. Uh, Eric Lowe with the uh, Fair Observer. Uh, I think you under, uh, you off about like uh, some of the people who fall off the, the cracks. I think uh, uh, that the one group that comes into mind is that uh, the, the 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 girls that were adopted by the uh, the Korean girls and the Chinese girls they were adopted by Caucasian parents. So basically, they grew up here, but they have an uh, American education. They are almost American, uh, mm -hmm. but they don't look it. I think that's come back into my my constant uh, consciousness when I look at the debate between Elizabeth Warren and uh, Scott Brown. It says, you know, oh, basically, uh, he she is American, but uh, she's not. She just looks different. So um, I don't. Uh, uh, my question would be, how do you uh, factor uh, like these groups into the to the mix? We had a conversation about that, Karthik, didn't we? And uh, it, it, it is going to be covered by the sampling process that uh, Karthik described, where you know we did a general population sample, and so um, non-Asian sounding names will be dialed, and hopefully we will capture some of this. Um, yeah, we, you know, I really uh, was struck by all the Asian American or part Asian American um, athletes that went to the Olympics, right? And as I looked down the list, I was like, a, a lot of them are Hapa, or some of them are adopted. And I was like, Karthik, our sampling process is not going to capture any of these athletes unless we do something different. So uh, we did make sure to capture those I need those to look voices. at occupation that we have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and those experiences are, are really important and valid uh, subset of our community, for sure. And we, we are interested in, in uh, capturing that. And, I think we'll be able to tell, right, in the deeper dives coming out. Yeah, I mean, the problem is that, you know, people have a probability of getting sampled, but the numbers yeah. will be so, will be so small. So again, we wish that we had a multi-million-dollar budget, yeah. um, but we don't. But this just this does point to the need to prioritize this kind of work. I mean, it's part of the reason why we got involved this time is that we felt that it's, no one else is going to be doing it. Now, we did have this survey uh, that Lake Partners did uh, earlier in the year, but you know, even that, it was, it was limited in terms of resources that, that people could throw at it. So in terms of the number of interviews, the groups that were sampled, and what we find, that the length of the interview, right? Uh, you, we can't, there's a limit to the number of questions you can ask before the costs uh, start going up. So for funders either in the room who have supported us or uh, remotely <laughs> who might be thinking about uh, supporting us, uh, we hope that, that the resources are, are well done. I think we have maybe time for one more question, Teku, and then some closing remarks. Just quick closing remarks by people. Can we take two? Well, let's take two. Okay. The number of people have been waiting. So or maybe we'll just collect questions and then we can talk about it afterwards. Next. Okay. I think there's a gentleman back there and then um, Janelle, I'll, I'll give you the last question. <laughs> Hi, Erwin uh, Delayon, Urban Institute. So did you find any uh, significant gender differences uh, along the issues? Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, I think we're going to collect a couple, right, Teku? Yes. And then yeah. So I think one of the most exciting, Janelle Wong, University of Maryland. One, uh, one of the most exciting and groundbreaking features of this survey is that Pacific Islander sample. Mm. That is so awesome, and I really congratulate you. So tell us. Uh, I know, Karthik, you were speaking that there's, there's some kind of interesting findings there, and I just wanted to highlight that this is something very new, getting this sample that can be directly compared with a larger Asian American sample. Maybe one more? Can I collect yeah. one more? There's, there's a gentleman up here that has been waiting for a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, ben de Guzman, uh, Ben de Guzman, the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance, um, also a Berkeley alum. So Nathan Adrian is one of the Hapa athletes that we hopefully will not miss. Go Bears. Um, <laughs> and I didn't realize you had been promoted, sir, so congratulations. Um, the One of the questions that I think um, is important for, I think, people to kind of be aware of is the partnerships between, you know, the academic community and, um, you know, the, the um, 
community-based organizations in terms of you know the resources and the connections that we have with the communities that are being studied and with the folks that have the kind of academic rigor to study them in ways that um, that will be perceived as you know um, as non-biased as, as they are. So can you talk a little bit about that journey that um, that many of us have taken together, especially you know in light with of other studies that have been happening this year, and as well as the ability of the ab the groups to know you know how to kind of access particular communities within the API community, like LGBT folks, like women, um, and that sort of thing. Great. Yeah, no, there's a, I mean, what I, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll start and then we can just, we can just go down. On the gender piece, um, Edwin, there, some of the things, they don't pop out when you just do the first cut, but as we know, sometimes you need to do deeper cuts, right? So generally speaking for Asian Americans, on, on a bunch of these things, that you, what's striking is, is the similarity. We do know that when you shift away from issue opinion towards participation, there's some important differences that's, that start emerging. But there are some differences, I bet, when we start cutting it by ethnicity and gender, or by class and gender, that we'll start seeing things, and we have enough sample um, to be able to do that. Uh, Janelle, in terms of Pacific Islanders, yeah, it's, it's been exciting. And one of the things that I want to try to do, and this speaks a little bit to the partnership, is that when we gave a preview of some of these findings on, on a conference call, you know, I mean, there's there's limits to what I know. As you know, so we all have our different expertise. But even as an academic, I I know certain populations very well that I can speak to. But I was like, we need to have someone. If a reporter wants to find out about Pacific Islanders, we need to have someone who can help make sense of these findings. Because I mean, I can pretend that I know, but that that won't be right, right? Yeah, but one of the, one of the things that is interesting is that with Pacific Islanders, even if you have a community that is not doing as well socioeconomically, it doesn't necessarily translate into more support for left-leaning policies. So I think that is that is important to note, that it, right? So it's, it's it kind of complicates this notion of class, that you might have very wealthy people supporting very progressive policies, and people who are not as well off who are not supporting progressive policies. Uh, to me, that's an important lesson learned there. And then finally, to Ben, um, it has been, it has been a, a, a good journey in terms of doing this. Typically, uh, academia and community organizations are seen as in opposition to each other. They have very different mandates. They have different ways of going about doing things. I think it's it's worked out well. I mean, I think funders typically are, you have academic funders that are skeptical of community organizations. You have community funders that are very skeptical of academics, think we're up to no good and can't be relied upon to produce things on time. Um, they would be right. <laughs> <laughs> And um, it's been good. And the way I think what it shows you is that there is a way that you can be scientific and rigorous and listen to people, right? Just because people, uh, you're listening to what people have to say and what their priorities are doesn't mean that you let them design the question to, get, to tell you what you want it to say, right? So we still, so I think that is important. There, there are aspects of academic integrity um, that, that we seek to maintain. Uh, in in the process that we do, so I think that this, uh, but but it's not easy to do, right? So there's some sometimes in which there are ways that you ask questions that some people might not like, but that is the way you should ask. Um, there are many other questions on women's rights issues and LGBT issues that we're hoping to release in the next uh, over the next few months. I mean, once the kind of the election is in the rear view and we go into next year, um, we have a lot of questions on LGBT issues that but we want to highlight. We also have a non-trivial number of people in our survey that either identify as LGBT or do, or who do not identify as straight. Mm -hmm. So we can start looking at, at, at the data there. And then finally, we hope uh, to run an online survey instrument and try to figure out a good sample of self-identified LGBTs and LGBT activists to see um, if their preferences and priorities might, might be very different from white, black, and Latino LGBTs, but also uh, uh, when compared to straight um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, so I'll be brief. Um, I think that there's been this newfound interest among um, research institutions and academics and government agencies in our communities, given the numbers that you've seen, right, fastest growing racial group. Um, but I think what's really important is that when the surveys and the polling is being done, that we're also asking about issues that matter to the everyday lives of people. And I think that's why this survey is important. And I think that's why um, a collaboration with community or based organizations and part, you know, academics and academic institutions needs to have that frame. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, with our communities, we are not a monolith. Uh, we're not a monolithic community. We have a 
large number of contrasts in you know every single um, demographic characteristic that you can look at, right? Um, but when it comes to issues, we are finding that across the board that there are a few issues that keep coming up over and over again that pertain to Asian Americans as a whole. And that's really where our political power is. And that's why a coalition like NCAPA can actually exist with all of these diverse institutions coming together under one coalition because we have the power of these issues that keep coming up that are important to the lives of our um, community members. Um, so I think that um, this sort of partnership is very important when it is framing the issues that matter to the everyday lives of people. And just the last push, you can pick this up outside. You can find it online. I want people to read it. I know it's long, but it's important. Um, www.encapaonline.org. I have some propaganda I want to push too, <laughs> but I'll get to that in a little bit. I, um, I'm really uh, honored and grateful to be part of this conversation. Um, I think earlier when Miriam was speaking, she referred to the fact that this research is so critical to disaggregate the so-called model minority myth, right? This, this mythical unicorn. I feel like for the Asian American community, we've always suffered under this, the twin pillars of whether, you know, either we are the model minority, um, therefore people can't really see the, the reality and the challenges, or we're these perpetual foreigners, right, who really don't belong. And in fact, why do you care to think about these individuals, these faces as being permanently part of the American landscape when they're eventually going to go back to where they came from? Right, And we've all heard that, right? Toss at us at one time or another. And it is because, actually, the reality of our community sits right smack dab in the middle, right, in the vacuum between being the perpetual foreigner and the model minority, that this kind of research is so critical. As a human rights and civil rights organization, the only way that I can have credibility at the table when I'm trying to advocate on a particular issue is or my voice is only as credible as the research and the evidence I can bring with me to talk about my community. And the reason why we're such a strong advocate and supporter, not only of creating our own research, so AJC in partnership with our affiliate partners, you know, every census year have, have published the demographic profiles. This year's demographic profiles is called Community in Contrast. And I've asked my staff to bring some. I'm not sure if it's out there, but we're more than happy to, to provide copies to any of you who are interested. Um, um, in addition to other research that we've done, we're such strong um, advocates and supporters of what Karthik and his team has done, it's because they're providing the credible research, the evidence that we need in order to make the case to people in positions of authority and power to be able to see the true face and the true challenges of our community. The last thing I'll say is that um, um, unless somebody walk out of this room thinking and unless, you know, unless that the message out to the public, to candidates and political parties should think that somehow this community should be written off because the research seems to point that we're trending democratic. Let me point out, mm -hmm. the detail in both our uh, Asian American voter survey as well as this survey shows is that there is a one third, there's a 31 to 34 percent independent block within the Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community that nobody has touched and no one has talked about. Yes, of the rest of the other two thirds, the majority may be indicating that they're trending democratic. But if you add that independent, you know, one third to the ones who are self-identifying as, uh, as, as trending Republican, that's a majority. That's a majority. So, so people should not mistakenly write this community off as being trending or already sold out or bought by the Democratic Party. In fact, that 31 to 34 percent margin, both in our survey and I think in the aggregate, what what this survey has, has indicated is that this community is up for grabs. And anybody who choose to invest their resources to engage this community will reap the results from that investment. And so when I talk about evidence, when I talk about people paying attention, you know, don't just read the headlines or the top lines. When you dig in, you will see that this community will be a significant player. So on that note, I do want to tell you that we have just released in partnership with API Vote and the Asian American Institute 
this uh, uh, nice little um, poster called Up for Grabs, Asian uh, America's Swing Vote, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And I hope that my staff has brought some copies and we'll leave it out there for you to look at. Um, it's an aggregation of information that, that came from the Our Voter Survey, as well as, you know, from public information that's available, really profiling, making the case why the Asian American vote really is the swing vote in this country in this particular election. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, just to visit the gender question really quickly, um, I think for the most part there we didn't see a lot of gender differences and a lot of preferences, but in the survey we did ask the question, you know, of these kind of issues, what would you categorize as most important? And women's rights was one of those questions that we were able to ask in the survey. And not surprisingly, um, Asian American Pacific Islander women, the majority of them, said that women's rights was one of those things that were most important to them. They were not m important to men either, which is also uh, great news uh, to us. Unimportant to men, you're saying. They were not unimportant. Right. That's a double negative. Right. Poor right. word construction. This is the kind of conversations we have all the time. <laughs> uh, so uh, we know we enjoy a lot of support from male allies within our community, but a vast majority say women's rights is an important issue. And no wonder. Right? Uh, Asian American women are politically active, and what they are seeing is extreme deadlocks in terms of women's rights issues. This is a year where uh, VAWA has not been reauthorized, and people are fighting over VAWA. We watched uh, affordable health care um, law almost be derailed by the issue of abortion, it almost be de uh, derailed by the issue of contraception, and Asian American women, like women across the country, are watching and seeing. Um, and standing up and saying, that's not okay. So uh, th this allows me, in line with me, uh, to, um, to have further ammunition in, uh, in the policy advocacy work that we do for Asian Pacific Islander women and girls. Um, and me does it so well, but I just wanted to copy her for, for a second. Uh, you know, it's absolutely true that um, we are a community, Asian American women are a community, to uh, be ignored at your peril. <laughs> did I do that? You did that one. Okay, <laughs> uh. <laughs> we're going to end with uh, Tiku. Yeah, so there's a lot more than we have time to cover in an hour and a half. We have two reports. They're available on naasurvey.com. Read it. Ask us any questions if you have it. And thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Thank you. <laughs> and. Uh, for people who are here live uh, uh, in the studio with us, so to speak, uh, we have a reception uh, outside, so please join us. And thank you again uh, to Bob and the Asia Program and the Wilson Center. <laughs>